Hello, everyone. In today's interview series, <clears throat> I'm very delighted to have Alexandra Horowitz, Professor of Psychology at Barnard College, Columbia University, and the head of the Dog Cognition Lab. Welcome to the Genius Dog Challenge, the interview series. <laughs> Alexandra, thank you very much for being with us today. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks. I said you are a professor of psychology, but also the head of the Dog Cognition Lab. Um, can you help us how this works? Are you a psychologist? Are you a comparative psychologist? Are you an ethologist? How would you <laughs> describe yourself? It is kind of tricky to figure out exactly what I am labeled as. I mean, I consider myself an animal cognition researcher or a cognitive ethologist because I'm interested in looking at the natural behavior of dogs and then making inferences about what they know or understand, right? So that would be ethology and a, with a kind of cognitive aim. Mm -hmm. cool. If you guys are wondering a bit more about the uh, terms that Alexandra just used, check up our next week's blog. We explain there everything about what is ethology and comparative psychology and that stuff. I know you started studying rhinos and then you started researching dog play. So how, how does this work together? <laughs> how did you move from rhinos to dogs? Yeah, I was very interested in graduate school uh, where I was studying cognitive science. So all sorts of different disciplines approaching the question of what is mind and how do we know about others' minds? Um, I was interested in, in non-human animal mind in particular. And because I thought looking at animal behavior in natural contexts, uh, or at least among you know other members of the species would be the best way to find out about their cognition, what they know, I joined a number of um, behavioral research projects, just become a better observer of behavior. So that included um, watching bonobos and uh, the southern white rhinoceros. And what was actually very interesting about that was that it made me attentive to the different perceptual skills um, that animals had and how appropriate they were for their environments and their contexts. Um, and I only got involved with dogs kind of accidentally. I didn't think I was going to be studying dogs, but I was looking for playing animals, animals who played a lot, because I know in human development, play is a very big part of metacognition, starting to understand about others' minds. And children use play as an entree into thinking about others. Um, and so I wondered if with a non-human animal, would their play reveals something about their mind. Um, and lots of animals play, as you know, um, even rhinoceros play, a little bit locomotor play. But I lived with a dog. I was taking her out three times a day so she could go play. You know, I was a, a typical, slightly narrow-minded graduate student. So it took me about six months before I realized, oh, I should study dogs. And this was at the time before there was a lot of dog research. Um, mm -hmm. So I turned to studying dogs and then dogs just became so interesting to me that they've been my study subject since. I think in your books, you're basically capturing everything that is being a dog because you speak a lot about play and you speak about smelling, which for me is like a dog is play, smell and tail pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should and speak tails too. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what, what makes a dog is a nose, a tail and something happy. <laughs> And you talked about like the animals um, environment. Um, I'm not going to use German terms, <laughs> uh, umwelt and stuff like that. Uh, when you were researching rhinos and bonobos, I I have a feeling you know that my dog is living with me in my own living room, so we're kind of sharing the same environment and the same world. Mm -hmm. But you also talk a lot about their sense of smell. So how much do you think this? differs this what's the difference between the world we live in and the world they live in mm. i think there is a really profound difference and maybe one of the unique things about dogs is that they can live in both worlds i mean they very much are responsive to our world and our cues and sensitive to what we're doing they kind of embody our umwelt a little bit 
but they also have this olfactory world that we're usually not privy to. And that's partly by choice. We don't often want to go around smelling things so closely, but also it's by anatomy, right? They are literally equipped to be smellers like lots of non-human animals in a way that we're not. You know, they're on the ground, they sniff closely to things. They have hundreds of millions more olfactory cells designed to grab odors out of the air. Their olfactory bulb is relatively much larger in their brain than ours is. You know, they have that long nose and specialized uh, muscles so that they're, um, they can, each nostril can catch different uh, odors. And so they're equipped to be smellers. And we also see this in their behavior. They're smelling all the time. They greet us by smelling, not just by looking at us. So I think they do live a little bit in a parallel universe with us, um, attuned to things that we often aren't. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And you have a very nice TED uh, illustration uh, about dog smells. So I'm gonna link this for you guys because this, I find this really, really amazing. How, how you explain it in that movie? Yeah, that was a I, lot of fun to do to think about it um, in a way that I think most people who live with dogs, and I do write a lot for people who are just curious owners, right? Um, yeah. To think about something that um, that they maybe haven't thought about before. In your book, our dogs ourselves, and I think this really relates because. Our dogs are also a lot what we make them. And there's a, I will try to quote you correctly here. You say that the way we select our dogs reflects on our own personality. It mirrors us. They are a demonstration of what we think is important in a companion. So what do you, how do you think we should treat them? Because we are selecting them to be one thing. Do you think we should treat them as our children, as our friends? Do you think, how do you think they would like us to treat them? Because you also talk about how they're not wolves, really. So tricky question, I know. Yeah, no, big question. And I think it's a good question to be asked, even if I can't give the, a perfect answer to it. And I don't think I can. I mean, they are, to some extent, members of our family, right? And so it's super to treat them as well as we would treat other members of our family. Um, and yet they can't have the responsibilities that other members of our family have. Um, so it also, at the same time as we're letting them into this intimate space, we also have to acknowledge um, their otherness, right? And treat them as, anim as non-human animals um, in a way that we wouldn't treat other members of our family. So I think you have to just balance their, their evolutionary story is a, is a unique evolutionary story and appreciation of their history and with as wolves, essentially, and as members of human households, both feed into how we should treat them now. And how do you think the, the whole play, because play is a very big part of, as you said, of being a dog, but it's also a very big part of being a human. So mm -hmm. how do you think this uh, maybe helps in our own, in, in the communication that we have or, or in the interactions we have with our dogs? I think that we like playing with our dogs. One of the uh, most becoming features of dogs, and, and as you know, we, we kind of have selected them for their juvenile characteristics, for their childlike state, is that we can play with them. They maybe return us as adults to an earlier time in our life when we played more often because you know human adults are not often players. We might spend the whole day without playing. So the dog gives us that chance. And it's also mm -hmm. a time of a real kind of tactile intimacy. A lot of play involves roughhousing or, or, or petting the dog and contact with the dog. And so I think we get a pleasure from that. That's a normal human to human pleasure, but that we can have with dogs in a safe way. Yeah. And I think definitely there is a lot of jumping around and playing with them, at least with my personal dog that I would probably not do with an adult human being. <laughs> right. Um, you've been in the field for a while and you mentioned that relatively dog research hasn't is quite a new field. Um, and you probably remember the first study that was done about a genius dog. It was a Rico from Germany in 2009. This dog knew the names of 200 toys. K 
can you tell us what did you think? How did you, when you first read this study, because you have a lot of experience with dog cognition and their mental abilities, what did you think about this research when it just came out? Well, there were aspects of it. Um, there are so many aspects of it. Well, first, it was thrilling. I mean, Rico was obviously doing something quite unusual that I hadn't seen before and that people were, hadn't been talking about in, in the dog cognition world. Um, it also was interesting because it was an owner who came to Julian, uh, um, Juliana uh, Kaminsky, and we get a lot of, as dog cognition researchers, a lot of people approach us and say, oh, I have this really smart dog or really interesting dog. And it's interesting when one of those pans out and it, that the dog is doing something that we can't easily explain and that surprises us given what we know about their cognitive facilities. And I was also really interested in the pushback from a lot of people in, in human cognitive mm -hmm. fields who were concerned that um, people were overreaching and saying that the dog was, in saying that the dog was doing something language-like in their naming mm -hmm. essentially of toys I, I thought it was interesting how much resistance um, one gets at, at saying that a dog can do anything that's even quasi-language-like, right? Um, so yeah. while I, as a scientist, was skeptical myself, right? And I, I reserved judgment, but I also was excited about the possibility and not wanting to be framed by my idea that humans are so exceptional and dogs can't do anything like us. I think it, it, only looking into the way they smell things, we feel a bit less exceptional. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that's apt. Yeah. So tomorrow we're going to have a chance to see two genius dogs. And I guess, have you ever worked with dogs like these? Dogs no, that know no. That... I haven't. Okay, so, so I hope you're excited, as excited as I am, because for me, every time I see these dogs, it's amazing. We have tomorrow... Um, Gaia from Brazil, and we have Nalani from Netherlands. And Alexandra is also going to be with us, and she's going to help us as our commentator and guest judge. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for being with us today, and we will see you tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Jenny. And to all of you at home, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss up on tomorrow's episode. See you tomorrow. Bye. I just went faster. I saw these messages from Claudia. Does that mean that it did not go through?